uh, and, and, and people outside the church would say, no, it doesn't. Biology definitely doesn't support the Bible. It, it, it uh, goes against the Bible. But um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at that. It actually does support the Bible. But just for the sake of review, I kind of mentioned in the first, uh, just before the break here, that there's, there's uh, or was hinting at it anyways, that there's one set of facts and they're interpreted to be either evidence for evolution or they're interpreted to be evidence for creation. And we kind of, kind of introduced that a little bit in the last session. For example, there's one earth, right? There aren't two different earths. One is evidence for creation and one provides evidence for evolution. There's one earth and it's interpreted to be evidence for evolution or interpreted to be evidence for creation. It's just one earth. There's one set of fossils. Here's some big fossils, dinosaur fossils. Many of them still, uh, or actually here's fossils in the basement of a museum. And many of those are still in the plaster cast that they used to transport them from the field. Lots of dinosaur fossils there. We study the same animals. Well, sort of. And here's a killer bunny rabbit. And I have no idea what that is. And, and these are not meerkats, they're mere cats, if you get the connection between the two. Never mind. We all have the same data. You can see it here in the center. We have the same dinosaurs and the same fossils and the same animals and the same plants and the same people groups. But we come to different interpretations up here at the top, not because the data changes, not because the science is any different. There isn't a single scientific observation that an evolutionist makes that, that a Bible believer would disagree with. It's not an argument about the science. It's an argument about the history. It's, again, just for sake of review, down here is where the differences are. You either believe that the history in the, in the Bible is true, that God's word is truth, or you make up your own history. And that's a, that might sound harsh, but that's what the evolutionists are doing. Nobody was there millions of years ago to see anything, or to record it, to write it down, or to make a video or something. They made it up, <laughs> right? Nobody was there. You, so you, you start with, with either of those two histories, and then that produces a way of thinking, and then you make the observations, the same observations that Bible believers make with a different history and different way of thinking. You make those observations, and you come to an interpretation of the evidence. That's consistent with your way of thinking, consistent with the observations, and consistent with your starting assumptions. And Christians do the same thing. You start over here, you make the observations, and you have a different interpretation because your starting assumptions are different. So that's just, a, that's just a bit of review, just to get us started. Now, what does the Bible say about the evidence for creation? Can, what, what verses, kind of the verses that people tend to go to are in Romans 1, right? Romans 1 talks about creation, for example, in verse 20, for his invisible attributes... Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. What this verse is saying is that there's so much evidence for a designer when you see the amazing design in, in God's world that people who don't believe in a creator God have no excuse. Everybody knows there's a creator, is what this verse is saying. And it doesn't seem to rule out any group or any, if, it, it, it doesn't seem to say, well, okay, if you're an atheist, then Romans 1.20 doesn't apply to you. Then you're not going to see the evidence for creation. It doesn't say that, does it? But na name an atheist. First atheist that comes to your mind. With Dawkins, okay. Dawkins, there's others as well, but uh, Richard Dawkins has become probably the world's most famous atheist. Over the last uh, 15, 20 years, he's probably the world's most famous, famous atheist. He's over there in England. He, he writes uh, uh, fun little books like The God Delusion. He believes that uh, uh, for those of you who believe in God, well, he's talking about us, of course, if, if, if for those people who believe in God, they're deluded. There's something wrong with their heads. There's, uh, there's, there, you're under a delusion, that kind of thing. Nice little books like that. And uh, he's not just an atheist. But he's an evolutionist, he promotes evolution, big promoter of evolution, and he's not just an atheist and an evolutionist, he's also an anti-creationist. He writes books and, and goes on, on, on BBC, radio and TV over there all the time, specifically attacking biblical creation. In one of his anti-creation books, he said this, we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. 
garden? That seems to be like something we would say, right? Yeah, living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. What's he talking about here? He's got designed in quotes. That's in the original there. What, what he's saying is, it, he's, he's basically admitting Romans 1.20, isn't he? He can see the design that's there in living things. And then he, he's admitting that there's design, but then he goes on in the rest of his little book here, The Blind Watchmaker, written many years ago now, to try and explain how we can have something that appears to be designed without a designer. Okay. Has he found a loophole in Romans 120? Can we have things that appear to be designed and not have a designer? Can you have a program without a programmer? Can you have a building without a builder? That's, that's kind of where he's, the road he's going down. So let's try and unpackage his argument to see if he's, if he's got a point here. He is talking about living things, living things there. He's talking about the basic building blocks of life, and that is DNA. The information, the, the genetic code, all living things have a genetic code. Uh, in every one of your trillions of cells, you have a complete instruction code for how to build and operate you. It's an instruction, it's a blueprint for how to build and operate a living thing. And what Dawkins and, and other evolutionists are saying is, you don't need God to get the information on the DNA, the programming for how living things work. You can get that through time and chance. You don't need God. So, okay, what's the, um, uh, uh, does, does he have a point? So life is based on information. That's, that's the, we, we know that now at the time of Charles Darwin, he didn't know that. Um, do we have a microphone issue? Okay, I can grab the other one if you want. Life is based on information. And, and Dar at the time of Charles Darwin, they didn't know that. We know that now. Even if you had all of the chemical structures to make a cell, this, this still wouldn't be life because you need the instructions so that the cell knows what to do. All those chemicals know what to do. Life is based on information. So the biggest question that we could ask, which applies to both us and evolutionists, is what generates the information needed for life? How to get there? In our genetic code, it's a three gigabyte code, three billion bits. It's a huge amount of complex coded information on our DNA to, to build and operate us. So how did it get there? So since we're talking about information, let's turn to information experts, people who know about information, know what it is and measure it and, and, and how it's transmitted and so on. Uh, Dr. Werner Gitt is an information specialist, wrote this book, In the Beginning Was Information. He's a Bible-believing scientist. He's, he's a German scientist. He's retired now. Uh, and amazing. He goes and speaks on university campuses. And there's, af after, the, after his meetings, students come forward and want to dedicate their lives to Christ. <laughs> Unbelievable. But he's an information expert. He's spent his whole life studying information. How do we measure it? How do we quantify it? What is it? That kind of thing. Defining it properly. He says in his book, a code system, and we can think here of the genetic code, the genetic code, a code system, is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intelligent origin or inventor. It should be emphasized that matter as such is unable to generate any code. All experiences indicate that a thinking being voluntarily exercising his own free will, cognition, and creativity is required. He goes on to say, there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. You know what? Dr. Gitt has just described what is one of the biggest arguments against biological evolution. And that is, where do you get the information? How do you generate the information that living things are based on? And what he's saying is that, Every time you see information, it always, always, always comes from intelligence. It doesn't come from a random process. And look, we, we don't need a scientist to tell us this. All of us know this from experience. If you walk along a beach in the summertime, or, or, or today, <laughs> tomorrow maybe, if you're going to the beach after church, and you see Johnny Loves Susie written there in the sand, you know that that's not the result of the action of the waves on the beach, right? 
That's the, if you, when you see information, you recognize it's from intelligence. Somebody who's intelligent wrote that there. Maybe somebody who's hopeful and intelligent put that there. But, but um, we, we know this from experience. When you see information, when you see graffiti on the side of a building or whatever, you, you might not be able to read it or understand it, but it's a message. It may be a gang sign or whatever it might be, but it's information. You know that it, it's not a bunch of exploding spray paint cans that, that put that there, right? It's intelligence that put that information there. So without intelligence, you can't have life. The end. That, that's, that it's, it's game over at this point for evolutionists because their whole scenario is that there is no intelligent designer. That life, us and all the other life on the earth got here through random processes, not intelligence. And yet everything we know about information tells us it always, always, always comes from intelligence. This is, it's a dead end for evolutionists. It's game over for, for this scenario. And, you know, so I'm just going to close in prayer and then we'll, uh, we'll all be dismissed. And we, but no, it, it, if, we, if we picture the evolutionary scenario, we can, we can end here. It's, okay, it's done. The Bible's right. Evolution's wrong. The end. Let's picture the evolutionary scenario. Just to wrap our minds around this a little bit in more detail. All life, apparently, starts with a single cell. Here's our single cell. Don't ask where that came from, but let's just start there. That cell would have had the instructions to build itself, obviously, represented here by these books. It would have had the information for the thousands of components inside the cell, for the cell membrane, which is very, very complex. It knows which, it has little pores that open and close. It knows which chemicals to let in and which chemicals to let out. Extremely complex. How does it work? Uh, that's being studied and that kind of thing. But then evolution says, the single cell went on to evolve over millions of years into a multicellular creature, something like this, for example, over millions of years. Which means that over those millions of years, you have to add new, never before existing genetic instructions that the single cell didn't have. That single cell didn't have the information to make things like fingernails and fingers and hands and arms and skin and muscles and bones and stomach and head and eyes and ears and knees and feet. It didn't have it. So evolution has to be an information gaining process. It has to be. In order to evolve a single cell into the life we see on the earth today, you have to add information that previously didn't exist. But information only comes from intelligence, not a random process. The end. <laughs> it's, and in case you think I'm making a bigger deal about this than I ought to, there was a, a film crew that went to the home of Professor Dawkins. And uh, I'm, I'm going to use this microphone here to try to pick up the audio. Um, and the interviewer, in case it doesn't come through, the interviewer asks Dawkins, uh, Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of an evolutionary process or a mutation which has been seen to add information to the genome? And you can listen to Dawkins' answer here. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Did you get that? You didn't really need audio, did you? It's, it's. And, and by the way, I, I don't show you this to try to poke fun at Professor Dawkins. He's, he's highly intelligent. There are many highly intelligent men and women all around the world who believe in evolution with all their hearts. I show you this to show you the bankruptcy of that particular belief system. If evolution is true, Dawkins should have been able to point to thousands of examples, right? Yes, we've seen information increase in a bacteria that we're studying in the lab here and here and in this organism here and out in the field. We've seen it here and here and here and here. It should be happening all the time. And yet we know, because we know about information, information doesn't come from a random process. It comes from intelligence. So every time that question is posed, that is going to be the answer silence. There isn't going to be information coming from a random process. It's, it, 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 again, it's dead in the water. Now, what, what, let's, let's turn the card around and think of, the, think of it from our perspective as Bible believers. Do we have a problem explaining where the huge amounts of complex coded information that, that, that is the basis for life for all the living things that we see, do we have a problem explaining where that came from? No. What does our belief begin with? In the beginning, God. The infinitely intelligent creator God, he put all of the information in every group of living things, then life works. It, 
it, it, we don't have a problem with that at all. The evolutionists have a massive, massive problem. And for them, believe it or not, it gets even worse. Let's talk about natural selection. We kind of talked about this a little bit with the Beatles on the island of Madeira. Let's go into more details. And some of you may have been thinking when we first talked about that, how can you talk about natural selection? Because isn't that evolution? So how can you say there's natural selection? Well, actually, creationists wrote about it before Darwin, 24 years before Darwin, a scientist, a Bible-believing scientist, Edward Blythe, published papers on natural selection. And some of them were mailed to Darwin, actually, when he was on this round-the-world journey on the Beagle, the HMS Beagle in the, in the 1830s. So Darwin read some of his papers on natural selection from a biblical perspective, within a biblical framework. It's an important part of the creation model today. We're writing more papers on natural selection than we ever have, and it has nothing to do with evolution. <laughs> Let me explain that last one there. You might think, well, hold it. I've been taught in school that natural selection over millions of years will lead to evolution from one kind to another. Wrong. Let me, let me, let's explain that. Let's go through that in some detail. Let's, let's think of a group of living things that we're kind of familiar with where there's great variety and then try and understand how that variety came about. Let's think of dogs, for example. We're kind of familiar with dogs. And there's all kinds of wild dogs. There's uh, foxes, wolves, jackals, uh, dingoes down in coyote. Uh, down, 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 uh, there's coyotes. There's dingoes down in Australia, is what I meant to say. All kinds of different wild dogs. And then in addition to all the wild dogs, there's over 650 varieties of domestic dogs, the dogs that we'd have in our homes. Uh, incredible variety within the dog kind. How did that come about? Are those dogs evolving? Is that, is that more information, that creeping in over time, that, that kind of thing? Let's, let's think about this in a biblical framework. Start with, uh, let's go back to the flood. There's a picture of what the ark may have looked like. There's Mr. and Mrs. Noah over on the right-hand side. Um, not sure there were trucks back then but uh, I guess just in there for scale. How many dogs would have got off the ark after the flood? Two, right? Two dogs. So there's the challenge for us as Christians. How do we explain the great variety that we have in the dog kind today from only two that got off the ark? Is that evolution? Let's have a look. So those dogs get off the ark. Let's imagine they get married and have kids and they get married and have kids and they get married and have kids. Now, this is church. I need to dress it up a little bit. But you know what's going on here, right? And after a while, you get lots of dogs. And every one of those dogs is a little bit different than mom and dad. And, and, and we, we can do the same thing with people. It's the same thing with people, right? If you have brothers and sisters, you and your brothers and sisters don't look exactly like each other, unless you're identical twins, and then you're actually clones. Did you know that? Your, 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 your DNA is the same. You're a clone of, of your identical twin. But if, if you're not, then you and your brothers and sisters look different than each other, and, and you and your brothers and sisters look different than your parents. And, and you might say, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, but why do you look different than your parents, right? Why, why don't you look the same as your parents? Isn't that the more interesting question? How do those changes come about generation after generation? Let's go back to the dogs here. So let's, let's imagine that, the, the, see, the Tower of Babel happened about 100 years after the flood, and then people started moving to different areas of the world. And let's say they take some dogs with them as pets, and they start moving to different areas. And if we travel with the group that moves northward from Babel, Babel was in the Middle East, maybe into, into Europe, into England, that kind of thing. And if we imagine a medium fur length pair of dogs, here's a mom and dad dog. They have the, the genes for long fur, L, and the genes for short fur, S. And it combines to produce a medium fur length dog. And they could have offspring that look like this. In that first example here, it got the information for short fur from dad, the information for short fur from mom. It didn't get any information for long fur, so it ends up having short fur. And you can have those other varieties as well. Based on that, it's just a recombination of the genes, right? Now, in that colder climate north of Babel, which of those puppies, which of those offspring do you think might be healthier over the long run, might leave more offspring? It, pr probably the dogs with a long fur, right? So after a little while, in that part of the world, the dogs with the genetic instructions for short fur aren't as healthy, don't leave as many offspring, and they're gradually lost from the population. And all you're left with are dogs with the information for long fur. Those dogs down here at the bottom have now become adapted to their environment through natural selection. That's natural selection. 
That, I mean, it's more complicated than this. I understand that. If you've taken biology, you know that already, but this is enough to get the basics across. That's natural selection. That's adaptation. These dogs down here are better adapted to the cold climate than their grandparents were up here. That's adaptation. That's natural selection, but that's not evolution. Why is that not evolution? Because they're still dogs. Yes, that's true. At the level of information, what's going on? There's, exactly, there's no new information. What does evolution need? New information, right? That's the name of the game with evolution. From a single cell to humans, new information, new information, new, new never before existing genetic information. And yet what's happening here? There's less information. Right? You can, you can breed these dogs down here for hundreds and thousands of years. You're never going to get a short fur variety of dog. That information has been bred out of that population of dogs. It's, it's the opposite of evolution. That's why I said a few minutes ago, natural selection has nothing to do with evolution. Yes, living things change from generation to generation. But the types of changes that scientists observe, these types of changes are the wrong kinds of changes. They're, they're not onward, upward evolutionary changes. They're going from lots of information to less information. You, you, we, could, we could think of uh, purebred dogs, right? Some of you might have purebred dogs. What do you do with purebred dogs? You, you keep information that you don't want in your dog, right? If you're trying to, if you're trying to breed a, a dog with short, shiny, reddish fur and pointy ears, you don't mix it together with a dog that has long, shaggy fur and floppy ears, right? You keep that genetic information out of your purebred dog. You limit the amount of information. That's, it, it's the same thing that's going on here. You're limiting the amount of information. Or think of natural selection as like a salad bar. Think of, you can think of a salad bar. You, you, can, you can go up to the salad bar hundreds of times if you're really, really hungry and have a different variety of salad every time. First time you go up, you might have you know, 90% Caesar salad and 10% potato salad and one bean. You know? And then the, the next time you go up, you have, you, have, you, know, you have different things every time, right? But if the salad bar doesn't have any pizza, you're never going to have pizza. But sad, I know, but it's... it's <laughs> Natural selection is like a salad bar. You can only, as, as the name implies, you can only select from what's already there. You know what works really well? If you start off with a huge salad bar. Right? If you start off with lots of genetic information there, then we can breed different types of varieties of, we, 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 we can understand as Christians how we have different variety within the human kind. We can breed different kinds of dogs or racehorses or, or flowers we can understand starting our thinking from a biblical perspective, biblical history, in the beginning God, he put a huge amount of genetic information in every group of living things, then we can explain how you can have differences within those living things. It's, it's high school biology, nothing more complicated than that. And we can explain life around us, starting with scripture. The evolutionists have a massive problem. So, because to get all these different varieties within the dog kind, you would have had to, by chance, not through intelligent programming, by chance, random processes develop all these different characteristics of all these different dogs. And science tells us that that doesn't happen. <laughs> you need intelligence to get that information there. Um, evolution, if it's represented in textbooks, some of you might remember this from your school days, it's often represented by a tree, right? You have a single cell, a single point, and that diversifies to give life, to give rise to all the, plant, all the plants and animals on the earth today, including humans. And if creation is ever pictured, it's often not, it's often pictured like this, like lawn or like grass. But that's a caricature. Even, even the Bible scholars, the, 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 the idea here is that God creates all living things and they don't change over time. Some of them have gone extinct, but they don't change at all over time. That's a caricature. Even the, even the, um, the Bible scholars at the time of Darwin, they recognized that animals must be able to change and adapt. Otherwise, if, if there isn't variety within a kind, how many dogs would Noah have had to take with him on board the ark? Every single one of them, right? 
Great Danes and Chihuahuas and German Shepherds and Poodles and Dachshunds and all the different varieties. And then there wasn't enough room on the ark. There was enough room on the ark. And we'll talk about this after lunch in the session on Noah's flood coming up uh, after lunch. That's not true, but that was, that was sort of the reigning paradigm in science at the time of Darwin. In the, in the early to mid 1800s, there was this notion of the fixity of species, fixity of species. And, and also this notion, notion of centers of creation. There's a center of creation over here where God created things. And, and, and these guys, generation after generation, they don't change at all. They're identical to their parents. And then over here, there's another center of creation where God created animals that are slightly different than these guys over here. And these guys, generation after generation, stay exactly the same. That was the reigning paradigm at the time of Darwin. But the Bible scholars realized that, okay, there's a problem with that. What actually happens, or what, what, what science actually sees, and this fits with the Bible, it's not a tree, it's not a lawn, but it's an orchard or a forest. God creates kinds of living things, and then there's diversity within a kind. Animals and plants still reproduce after their kind, but there's diversity within a kind. That is both what scientists see and what Scripture says. Again, science supports the Bible. Great time to be a Christian. So we can say, in order for the story of evolution to be true, it requires an information-gaining process. That's the name of the game with evolution, right? More information, more information, more information. But natural selection is an information-losing process. It doesn't fit with evolution. And yet, I guarantee you this, if some of you are taking biology, if you have your biology text at home, go, go home this afternoon after we're finished here. Open your biology text to this chapter on evolution. I guarantee you this is what the textbooks are doing. They're saying, students, look at, look at these examples of natural selection. We, we can breed different types of roses or tulips or racehorses or, or dogs or, or whatever it might be and get these different, we, we, we have different varieties. And things, things change a little bit from generation to generation. And, and we can all nod our heads and say, yes, we can see the little changes. But then what the textbooks do is they say, well, all you need to do is add millions of years, and presto, one kind can evolve into another kind. That's evolution. That's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how many millions of years you add, the types of changes that scientists see, the types of changes that are produced by natural selection are the wrong kinds of changes. If you add millions of years, living things are going to be extinct. <laughs> They're not going to evolve into something else. They're going to, they're, we're heading for extinction. But nevertheless, at a junior high level, if we kind of think of evolution at an at a introduction to science, a very, like just an introductory level, we could kind of put it in, in a, little, a little equation. Natural selection plus mutations are supposed to equal evolution from one kind to another. Mutations are supposed to provide for the new features and functions, and then natural selection comes along and eliminates the less fit varieties of those. And at that sort of simplistic kind of introduction to science level, it seems like it should work, right? Well, why wouldn't that work? Nat mutations provide the differences in living things, and then natural selection just produces the best one, just, just chooses the best one, right? Why wouldn't it work? Well, natural selection doesn't do what the evolutionists wanted to do, because it, it's not a creative process, doesn't produce anything new. Are mutations the savior for evolution? Is that, are mutations gonna save the day here? If natural selection won't do it, let's, let's talk about mutations. What are mutations? Mutations are random changes to the genetic code. There's three, three billion bits, a three gigabyte code. If we were to, let's think about if, they are, if they're good or bad. Um, if we take a complex code, let's say Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and if we get the sheet music and we, we put it up with tape on the walls around the church here, I'm not sure how many loops we'd have to do, and then we blindfold, our all, our, blindfold ourselves and give ourselves mar magic markers and go around and put notes on the, on the, at random places on the wall, is that going to improve the Ninth Symphony? No. It's, it, it, it's not, it's going to wreck it. That's what mutations do. They're random, because people think, oh, no, mutations, that's, that's what happens when you get bitten by radioactive spiders, and then you can shoot spider webs out of your wrists and climb up to the ceiling and stuff like that, and that's what you do, we become X-Men. That's, that's in the movies, and it's, that's science fiction, right? It's fiction. It's fun to kind of make a movie about that, but that's, it, that doesn't, it's not what happens, and yet people think that's what mutations do. And yet, you don't see evolutionists 
going to um, going going to the Fukushima reactor in Japan that that uh, that was overcome by the tsunami a few years ago that has high radiation ionizing radiation and setting up you know campgrounds around the areas. Hey, we, we need more mutations. We're going to uh, we're going to evolve into the next level of humans, right? No, we understand mutations are bad. Uh, they don't do good things. Now, mutations result primarily through copying errors. As the DNA is copied, every time there's cell division, for example, all of us started as a single cell inside mom, right? Let's not talk about where that came from, but a single cell inside mom, so there was one set of your genetic instructions, and then there was two cells and four and eight and 16 and so on. And today we're trillions of cells. So your DNA has been copied many, many times since that first cell. Every time there's cell division, every time the DNA is copied, there's between two and three mistakes that creep in. Now the, now the cell has amazing error checking mechanisms, but it's not perfect. Some of those mistakes get through. So that by the time you're 15, your cells have reproduced so many times, by the time you're 15, the av I don't know if we have any 15 year olds here, but uh, the average cell in your body, some will have more, some will have less, the average cell in your body has 6,000 mutations. We're all mutants. <laughs> Thousands of times over. We're all X-Men, right? But nobody's shooting laser beams out of their eyes yet or, or uh, are able to be invisible or anything. But that, that's not what mutations do. The average skin cell in a 60-year-old has 40,000 mutations. <laughs> it's no wonder your skin isn't soft and rubbery like a little baby anymore, right? You, and, and no amount of oil of delay is going to stop that either. It's, it's, <laughs> it's mutations. And, the, and this, the same thing's happening with all your vital organs, not just your skin. Your liver, your kidneys, your stomach, every, everything's going downhill. It's all, it's, it's because of, or, or think of it this way. Mutations is what God uses to kill us. It's kind of morbid, right? But I mean, the Bible says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. God's got to kill you somehow, otherwise you're never going to get to heaven, right? But don't, don't worry, all of us will die, so that's, that's not, a, not an option. But if you, if you die of natural causes, so-called, you're dying of mutations. That's, that, that's biologically, that's why we die. We, we die. we die because of sin, spiritually, but biologically it's mutations. Well, here are some types of mutations, just for fun. Uh, here's a substitution. If we start with this genetic code, the, the genetic code has four, four letters, A, G, C, T, not, not 26 like our alphabet. If we start with that code there and we substitute that one there, we might end up with something like this. That's one type of mutation that scientists have observed. They've also observed insertions. If we start with that same code as we did above, and then we insert something here, we might be left with that. That's another type of mutation scientists have seen. Uh, here's another one, deletion. You can probably guess what that's gonna do. If we start with that same code as the, the two examples above, and we delete those two guys there, then we're left with that. That's another type of mutation. And there's other types as well, frame shift, inversions, duplications, translocations, a few other uh, types. Now let's relate this to humans. We just, we just talked about dogs. Let's make this a little more personal. Talk about mutations in humans. See, some of these mutations that accumulate in, in our bodies as we age, some of them are passed on to the next generation so that every new generation of humans starts life off with more mutations than we had in our genes when we started life off. Now, way back in the 1950s, the leading human population geneticists were becoming very concerned that the rates of mutations creeping into the human population might be as high as one. One new mutation every single human generation. Why were they so concerned? They were so concerned because humans are supposed to have been evolving for millions of years, going back to a single cell, but if the mutation rates in humans are that high, the human race would be doomed to extinction. It's just a matter of time. Again, these mutations are blowing away bits of the instruction code for how to build and operate you. You can only do so much of that and pretty soon the code isn't gonna work anymore, right? That was the 1950s, that was a long time ago for some of us. What are the leading human population geneticists saying today, almost all of whom are evolutionists? Not one that they were concerned about in the 50s or two or five or 10, 100 to 300. Every new generation starts life off with at least 100 new mutations. What would that look like? Imagine that's Adam and Eve, or your great, 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 great grandparents, same thing. 100 mutations per person per generation. That means everybody in the next generation would start life off already having 100 more mutations than their parents had. 
and the next generation, 200. And the next generation, just, just, just do, do the math. It just goes onward and upward from there. That's a major problem for human evolution. And scientists have taken all of that data and put it into fancy graphs like this. This is, um, actually, this is an output. If, I don't know if there's any students here studying genetics. Um, this is an output from a computer program. This is the most accurate evolutionary modeling program ever produced. It's produced by computer engineers and, and geneticists. Ironically, they're Bible-believing computer engineers and geneticists. But it's, um, um, we can just run through this quickly here. On the vertical axis over here, you have fitness. These red pluses that form the sloping line down here, that's fitness. Fitness is basically a measure of our ability to live and survive and, and carry on the human population. You start with 100% fitness up here, you have zero down here. When you get to zero, you have extinction. And, and theoretically, it wouldn't go smoothly to zero, you'd get close to zero, and then humans would be so sickly, you'd just have catastrophic collapse that would just tail off there at the end. Along the bottom here, we have number of generations, up to 200. There's, there's been about 200 generations from Adam to us. So this sort of represents where we're at as, as a human species, if you want to think of it that way. It doesn't look very good, does it? And, and we're aware of this. We have, we have genetic problems that, 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 that some of us might have and our kids might have, and we, we, we have these, these problems creeping in generation after generation. The challenge for evolutionists would be Get a hold of this software. And by the way, if you want to download this, it's available for free on the internet. Go to mendelsaccountant.info. Mendelsaccountant.info. You know, Gregor Mendel, the father of heredity. You can download, you can play with this stuff for free. And uh, if you, if, for evolutionists, get the software and try to get, to you can change these, these uh, values here. There's a lot of other values you can change in the admin section of the software to try to get fitness to remain at 100% for millions and millions and millions of years. You know what? You can't do it. It doesn't work. And so, so humans, uh, evolutionists believe that, that we had true humans about a million years ago. And before that, there was the ape man series. You know about that. And before that was like lemur type creatures. Well, going back millions of years to a single cell. You know what? The science of genetics and the rate at which mutations are creeping into the human population today says absolutely not. That history, the, the supposed history that humans have been evolving for millions of years, going back to a single cell, science says it never happened. If we've been evolving for millions of years, we'd already be extinct. There's way too many mutations. The rate of mutations creeping in is far too high to ever have human evolution over that immense period of time. Have you heard of beneficial mutations? You've, you've heard that term before? Beneficial mutations? And we would agree from a certain point of, view, uh, point of view, mutations can be beneficial, sort of. So we could say that mutations can produce a functional benefit as they drive living things to extinction. <laughs> so, so in this, and it's not just humans, all living things are, that, that's the number one cause of extinction actually. Their species going extinct, it's genetic drift. It's mutations, mutations are the number one cause of extinction. Things just get genetically to the point where they can't cope anymore. Pandas are a great example of that. Pandas are, are, are they need a very specific type of food in a very specific environment. Years ago, the, the bear kind years ago were way more robust. They could have survived on garbage and all kinds of stuff. But pandas represent kind of the genetic end of the line. They're very difficult to keep alive. That's why we have these conservation programs to try and breed more pandas to, to build up the population. But they're the result of bad genes, of mutations. So mutations can produce a functional benefit as they drive living things to extinction. And, and, and have you heard of, speaking of mutations being beneficial, Bacteria can evolve resistance to antibiotics. Have you heard that before? That's evidence for evolution, antibiotic resistance. This bacteria, through a mutation, evolved a resistance to the antibiotic. Look, it's getting better. That's an example of evolution. All right, now that's, let's have a look at what's going on there. Is that really an example of evolution? Let's look at a real life example. Um, this is many years ago now, H. pylori bacteria, and this was written up in the, in the scientific literature. You have, you have these bacteria in your stomach. You have too many of these guys, they eat the lining of your stomach. You have too many, they, they, they'll, they'll eat holes in your stomach lining, get ulcers. 
And if this is something that maybe some of you have suffered with, um, you take medication, go to the doctor, he gives you some medication, here's how it works. You take the antibiotic, it's absorbed into the cell. Inside the bacteria, there's an enzyme, a chemical reaction, that converts the antibiotic into a poison, into a toxin. And that's what kills the bacteria. It works very well, the bacteria dies. Now, there's a known mutant variety of H. pylori bacteria. In the mutant variety, when you take your medicine, you take the antibiotic, it's absorbed into the cell in the same way as the normal variety, but the mutation has caused the bacteria to lose the ability to produce that enzyme. So the antibiotic is not converted into a poison and the bacteria lives. It survived because of a loss of genetic information, a loss of function. And that was, this is again, a real life example, and this was written up in the scientific literature as ev evidence of evolution happening before our eyes. You know, you, you Christians, well, wow, you're really silly, because look, evolution. Is that evolution? The bacteria has lost the ability to do something. And, and it's, the, the mutations are driving it toward extinction. Now, in that process, yeah, these mutations are causing it to do some really interesting things. But that's not evolution. It used to have the ability to produce this enzyme. Now it can't do that anymore. It's going the wrong way, isn't it? Or if, that, if, that's, if that's too complex, let's think of a simpler example. Let's say, let's say you have a bicycle. You're going to go out later, later this afternoon and, and ride your bike. Let's say you're an evolutionist and you have a bicycle. And you want to randomly mutate your bike to, to give you a better bicycle, right? And so you take a two by four and you smash the front tire of your bicycle. Now, you used to run, drive down the road like, like nice and like this. Now it kind of goes like this, <laughs> right? It's doing something new, isn't it? It's doing something it hasn't done before. And we can all nod our heads and say, yes, it's doing something new. And you might say, hey, well, that, that's tremendous. I'm, I'm evolving my bicycle. I'm going to have a moped pretty soon. So, so you think, this is great. Let's, I'm going to mutate it again. And so you, you take one of the little, the little uh, uh, pins out of the chain. The chain falls off. Now you can pedal that bike like mad. You could never pedal that fast before. See, it's doing something new, isn't it? And silly example, but we, we can all say, well, yes, it's doing something new, but is your bicycle getting better as a result of these mutations? No, You're, it's, it's the same thing. The cell is not getting better. It's being driven to extinction, just like your poor bicycle. Is it doing something new? We can, we can say with the evolutionists, we can say, yes, I agree with you. It is doing something new, but that's not evolution. Evolution requires the gaining of new features and functions. It lost the ability to produce that enzyme. Now in the process, it's, it's doing some weird things, but that, that's not evolution. If we look at those things in detail, it, it just doesn't fit with evolution. So what can we say? Natural selection, adaptation, speciation, we didn't even talk about speciation. Mutations all support the Bible's history. It's a great time to be a Christian. <laughs> uh, I've said that before, haven't I? Maybe, yeah. You know what, and we often have articles in Creation Magazine uh, on, on natural selection, simple articles, we walk you through it. Here's, it, often these, these things are in the, the popular media and talk to our kids and that kind of thing. And we walk through, that is, is this actually something evolving and getting better, something that could, we could see happening on the, the, the trajectory between a single cell working up towards something like a horse or a human? And those aren't the kinds of changes that scientists see. So there's articles in there. Uh, we talked about this already. The, again, the sign-up forms, we're not going to pass them around again. Uh, there's, there's lots of articles on creation.com with information about uh, natural selection, real-life examples, just like the H. pylori we just talked about. So if, if you or your kids are doing, doing projects on evolution, if, if you're a student and you're doing projects on evolution or something like that in school, the website is a great, great resource that you can go to to really help, your, help you wrap your mind around you know, what's actually going on here when living things change. Are the types of changes evolutionary types of changes that could lead a single cell to humans? Or are they actually taking living things in the other direction? Because then it's not evolution, is it? Is it? Uh, we've done a lot, of, a lot of TV shows, a lot of those half-hour episodes on, on genetics and, and epigenetics. That's an exciting field. And all kinds of different uh, examples of natural selection. The Evolution's Achilles Heels book that I talked about has great sections on genetics. And if you, that, now that's a little more of a detailed book. 
Again, nine PhD scientists, so if you're looking for something a little more in-depth, uh, that's a great book to get, and many other um, evolutionary so-called evidences are discussed there. This DVD that I mentioned briefly, Creatures Do Change, but it's not evolution. Dr. Don Batten, one of our PhD scientists from our Australian office uh, in, in biology, he does a brilliant job of separating natural selection from evolution, kind of like I'm, I've done here in the last 40 minutes or so. Those are completely separate ideas. And yet, as I said, in your biology texts and your kids' biology texts, they mash them together. They, 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 they give examples of natural selection and they say, well, kids just add millions of years and presto, you have evolution. It's not gonna happen. That's, that's not the way it works. And, and Dr. Batten does a wonderful job. By the way, what you wanna do if, if your kids are, are um, uh, going to public school and, and, and having to take evolution and so on, what you don't want to have them do is stand up in the class and say, you know, this is ridiculous and I don't believe this, and I'm a Christian and evolution is nonsense and, 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 and tear a stripe off the poor teacher. But that you'll, you'll, your, your child will fail, right? You can, don't do that. We don't encourage people to do that. Here's another suggestion. Get something like this, a DVD by a scientist and have, have your child go to the, after the other students leave, have them go to the teacher and say things like, you know what, teacher, I, you, you know I'm a Christian, I don't believe this evolution stuff. Would you have a look at this DVD? This is more along the lines of what I believe and, and, and tell me what you think about it. You could do that, right? Don't, don't you, you might win over your teacher. Never know, right? Have a, have a PhD scientist on your side to, to talk about the differences. The textbooks aren't gonna do it, okay? to talk about the differences between natural selection and evolution. Or the Evolution's Achilles Heels DVD, that's got a great section there as well. Now, this, this DVD is one whole DVD on that subject, which I think is just brilliant for students. Parents, if you have students kind of in junior high, starting to get their feet wet in science, or certainly in high school, they need to, they need to view this DVD. Um, great stuff. And it's, it's, there's a pack back there of DVDs. That information on, on humans going downhill at a phenomenal rate, that came from this book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Human Genome, written by John Sanford. Uh, Dr. John Sanford is a brilliant scientist. We had him actually last month, just a month ago, um, we had a, a super, what we called the Creation Super Conference up at NBC. Muskoka Bible Center, about a couple hours north of here, up in the Muskokas, beautiful part of the world. We flew him in. We had, we had 10 speakers over six days. I was one of the 10. had the privilege of, of speaking on the platform with other, other scientists. Dr. Sanford is a brilliant geneticist. He's actually fairly famous. He was the, the co-inventor of the gene gun that shoots bits of, it's for gene splicing. University students use this. It's, it's in many hospitals around the world as well. He was an atheist and an evolutionist. He said evolution was how he processed everything. Every, evolution was his religion. That's, that's what he said. Then he became a Christian. And we had him, again, last month at our super conference there as one of the guys on the platform. I had the privilege years ago, our, our US office did a super conference back in 2010, that's seven years ago now. And um, I, we, we, were, we were in the same room there for the, for the duration of the conference. And so I got to know him a little bit. We were, we were roomies there for, for uh, a few days. He is the most humble, scientist and just he realizes how much God did to save him because he was so anti-God and so by his own admission and today he's just he's so such a, a, a wonderful humble scientist because he recognizes how much God did to save him brilliant brilliant book just incredible stuff my wife read it and she's she's she she's not scientific but she read it she loved it um, great book here's a great book for students refuting evolution it's, it's really good for students because what we did in this book is a number of years ago, there was a, a booklet sent around to public school teachers across the U.S. for how to teach evolution. Teachers, this is how you teach evolution. You teach it as fact and you use this evidence and this evidence and this evidence and this evidence to teach your students evolution as fact. In this book, we had one of our scientists go through that book and refute every single one of those evidences. <laughs> So this is going to touch on the evidences that are taught in the public education system today. That's what makes it so good for students. So parents, that's a great one to have your students read. Dr. Werner Gitt, I quoted from one of his other books, In the Beginning Was Information. This is the updated version. Brilliant, brilliant book. Absolutely demolishes evolution from a biological information perspective. And then there's, there's other books back there. There's all kinds of other stuff. But um, great, we have about 15 minutes till lunch. All right, there's made up some time here. So. Um, we can do some questions. 
if that's okay. Um, all right. So what what we'll do is we'll just we'll take a few minutes, but we can we can end early as well. Let me put. Uh, yes, here we go. These are typical questions that Christians have. This is all around the world. The ministry has been going now for nearly 40 years, started in Australia years ago. There's seven offices now, speakers speaking all over the world. The churches we go and visit, Christians have similar questions. And it's no surprise, the Bible doesn't change, and we hear about evolution, and, we, and it causes us to question things in Scripture. These are typical questions that Christians have. If you see something up there, you want to discuss, you can just shout out the number. You don't have to ask questions off the screen. If you want more details on the things we've been talking about here, uh, certainly go, on, go ahead and ask that. If you've always wondered something about Genesis and, and uh, don't have the answer, ask, ask away. So, do we have any questions? We can just spend about 15 minutes or so. Yes, in the very back there. Yes. Okay, okay, let's, let's try and do simpler examples. Um, that was a real life example that involved a mutation. Since we were talking about mutations, that's why I stuck that in there. Most of the time, it doesn't even require mutations. So bacteria have other bacteria that are similar to themselves, right? And there's, there's differences and so on. And then, or, or we can think of, let's do, um, uh, hand sanitizer. Hand, I don't know if there's any hand sanitizer here. You, 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 you know a hand sanitizer, right? You take a couple squirts and rub it on your hands and stuff, and it kills 100% of the bacteria, right? No. What does it say? It does 99.99%, right? So what is happening there? If we think of, if we think of, it's the same thing as, as here's an antibiotic produced. Let, well, just, just stick with a hand sanitizer, maybe simpler. So you'll, you'll have a variety of bacteria on your hand, but there is a very small fraction of a percent that the hand sanitizer can't touch. The bacteria are already resistant to the hand sanitizer. They haven't evolved a resistance. They're already resistant just because you have different variety of bacteria on your hand already. So then what happens? So then you, you apply the hand sanitizer, it wipes out 99.9% .9 of the bacteria, and you're left with the bacteria that are already resistant to the hand sanitizer, that the hand sanitizer can't touch. Now those bacteria have a lot of real estate to repopulate on your hands, and so now you have a whole swath of bacteria on your hands that the hand sanitizer can't touch. That's and the, that's, that's a similar example to antibiotic resistance. The antibiotic resistance, the, the one I just mentioned, involved, uh, involved a mutation. In the hand sanitizer, no mutation. We can think, uh, here's, here's another example, maybe to make the same point. Uh, years ago, DDT, remember, remember spraying DDT for mosquitoes? Remember that? Yeah, okay. And the, and the DDT wiped out let's say 99.99% .99 of the mosquitoes. But some mosquitoes were already resistant to the pesticide. So what happened? It, that the pesticide's applied, it's, it's wiped out 99.9% .9 of all the mosquitoes, but there's 0.001% that are already resistant. Now they go on to repopulate, and now you've got a whole population of mosquitoes that are resistant to the pesticide. Because they always were resistant. But that example, the mosquito example, was written up in the evolutionary literature around the world as evidence of evolution in action. The mosquitoes have evolved a resistance. And then scientists did more work and they said, uh, no, actually, they were already resistant. No evolution, they were already resistant. There was, um, there's, there's people that climb really, really high mountains um, and then freeze to death, like Everest and so on. And have you, have you ever seen documentaries on this? People, there's frozen bodies on Mount Everest because the people that go up there now, it would take too much energy to bring them down because then they would die. But they, they, 
One of these fellows was found um, just a few, maybe 10 years ago, something like that, and frozen solid, in, I think from some Antarctic expedition. I forget exactly where. He wasn't on a mountain. He was some, on some Arctic or Antarctic expedition. They brought him back, and they analyzed some of his cells and found, <clears throat> excuse me, and found that his cells were all, some, some of the bacteria that he had were already resistant to today's antibiotics. So the, the cells are already resistant, just like the mosquitoes, a section of those are already resistant to the pesticides that we have. But here, so here, here's what ha let's, let's let's take it a step further. Let's go back to the mosquito example. That, that's kind of maybe simpler to understand. So now we have, after the pesticide is applied, 99.99% of the mosquitoes are wiped out, but now there's a small fraction that go on to repopulate that have always been resistant to the DDT, but all of these other mosquitoes, this 99.99%, they may have had all kinds of other features and functions that the small little percentage that, that are resistant to the pesticide don't have. So now this new population of mosquitoes are less robust than the original population before the pesticide was applied. Yes, they've overcome the pesticide, but you've wiped out all kinds of maybe interesting features that the other mosquitoes had. But they, they're le or, or a similar example, um, Dr. Carl Wieland is, um, he's the fa kind of the grandfather of the ministry. He started Creation Magazine in 1978 on his typewriter. So next year, 19, uh, 2018, is going to be year 40 of the, of the magazine coming out here actually just in a few months. It's going to be the 40th anniversary edition. He was, he was involved um, in, in, the, in the early 80s. He was moving his family across Australia, driving across the outback. At night, his family, he was in a, in a care with all their, all their, he was moving across the country and uh, fell asleep at the wheel with his family in the car and he hit one of these road trains head on. You know, in Australia, they have, they have, a, they have a tractor and then three trailers, right? These massive things that drive across the outback. He, it, he's, he's had like all kinds of reconstructive surgeries. His, his one leg is about six inches shorter than his other eight leg. He wears these huge platforms on, on one of his shoes. Um, it, he's all kinds of reconstructive surgeries. He was in the hospital once when the, some of these super bugs went through the hospital and they killed just about all the, all the patients were killed. It was, he was still alive and, and uh, um, you, you heard of these super bugs? These, they, they, the, the hospital environment is so clean. There's, there's antiseptic things everywhere and they wipe out these things. But some of these bacteria are already resistant to the Lysol and to the, the, the things that kill the bacteria. They become resistant to, or they're, they're, they don't become resistant. See, I'm even using evolutionary terminal, terminology. They're already resistant. And then they go on to repopulate. So now you've got on, your, on the floors and on your, your, your forks and everything, you've got these bacteria that, well, I thought I sanitized this, but the bacteria are resistant to the sanitizer. And so now the thing is, every time you have a new sanitizer, it wipes out a, a, a greater and greater percentage. And so these super bugs are actually super wimps. Like, like the mosquitoes, all this great variety in the mosquito kind was wiped out, and now it's been lost from this new population that sprung up that's already resistant. And then if there's another, a different pesticide applied, and it wipes out 90% of those mosquitoes, and only a few are left, can you see how genetically the mosquito population is going downhill? And it's the same thing with these super, a similar example in the hospital with Dr. Carl Wieland. He was in there getting some of these reconstructive surgeries. Other patients are dying in the hospital all around him because the hospital can't overcome these, what they call super bugs. And, and the advice that was given to him was, was almost, it was almost like, you know what? These super bugs are really super wimps. The only place they can really survive is in the hospital. It's because all of the other bacteria that normally compete and overpower these so-called super bugs have been wiped out. So now you've got these, these things there that are attacking people and so on. And, the, and the, the doctor basically kind of gave them instructions, go outside and roll in the dirt. You, you need to get other normal the healthy so-called bacteria in there and they'll overcome these, these so-called super bugs because they're actually super wimps. If you, if you introduce back in the other normal bacteria that's healthy, that lives on your skin and in your stomach to digest your food and so on, you wipe all those out and you're... you're is that making more sense? There's, there's a few examples of 
it, if, you, if you have a big picture view, the population of mosquitoes is going downhill. If you have a big picture view, the population of the bacteria in the hospital is going downhill. Yes, yes, because imagine all of the all of the interesting features that would have been wiped out in the other mosquitoes. If, if you, you've, you've a, a very small percentage of mosquitoes has survived, but all the other guys that were wiped out, maybe maybe some of them were a little bit bigger and stronger, and maybe some of them had red hair instead of black hair, and maybe some of them had big strong hind legs, and some of them could breathe really well.